I grew up in a small town, three small towns in South Jersey till I was nine, and then I moved to Richmond, Virginia when I was nine. I was there till I was 18. And, and what did you study in college, and what were your early career aspirations? You didn't always want to be an investor. Uh, I was uh, an English major my first two years, and uh, I wanted to be an English professor. My first semester of my junior year, I took a course in economics so I could read the newspaper, because I wasn't very good at it, even though I was supposedly an English major. And uh, fell in love with the subject and crammed an economics major in, I think I took 18 out of my last 21 courses were economic courses, something absurd like that. And then I wanted to be an economics professor. So I wanted to, be, I wanted to teach, I love teaching. How old were you when you started your first fund and, and how much did you raise? Well, I was 28 years old. I was, I w when I was 27, I was director of investments for Pittsburgh National Bank. I was running $6 billion. And I was doing a pretty good job because the show of Iran went under and I had no experience whatsoever. So I said, this is easy. Let's put all our money in oil stocks and defense stocks. If I had been a little older, a little wiser, I would have diversified. It went up a lot, so everybody thought I was a genius. I wasn't a genius, I just didn't know any better. Um, so I go to this dinner in New York. I'm making 43000 a year, and I give a presentation on the gold, and the guy says, you don't sound like you're from a bank. Why don't you, why don't you start a firm? And I said, with what? I'm worth about four grand." And, and he says, uh, well, I'll pay you $10,000 a month to talk to you. So. I started Duquesne Capital, and he said, you can raise money. Well, I'm such a good salesman. After a year and a half, I'd raised $900,000. So that's what I started with, $900,000. Two years later, the guy that paid me $10,000 a month to talk to me, I woke up one morning, and he was going to jail. Um, <laughs> he had some scheme, and it cost Chase Bank $256 million. By then, I was up to a grand total of $7 million with a 1% fee. For those of you who went to the wrong school, I know all USC people can do the math. I had 70,000 a year in revenues and my overhead was 160 and I was in deep, you know what. Talk about your investment philosophy and why you, know, you got those types of results. How did you do it? Well, my idea of risk control is a little non-conventional. I like putting all my eggs in one basket and then watching the basket very carefully. But at most business schools, they teach, I think, a lot of nonsense called risk-adjusted return and diversification. Ouch. As a money manager, if, if you look at a normal portfolio, most people will make 70, 80 percent of money that year on two or three ideas, even though they'll have 30 or 40 things in their portfolio. My concept was to put into those two or three ideas that I had the most conviction in. I was also lucky to travel across asset classes, so I traded commodities, currencies, bonds, and equities, and it gave me the discipline. If I didn't have a good idea in equities, I was happy to have no equities, or the same thing with bonds. So when you have a quiver with a bunch of arrows in it, you can usually find something to put a lot of money into. The only other thing I'd say is too many investors look at the present, the president is already, is already in the price. You have to think out of the box and sort of visualize 18 to 24 months from now what the world is going to be and what securities might trade at. You know, what a company has been earning, is it doesn't mean anything. What you have to look at is what people think, what a company is earning, what people think it's going to earn, and if you can see something two years, it's going to be entirely different than the conventional wisdom that's how you make money. My first boss used to say the obvious is obviously wrong. If you invest in conventional wisdom, you're gonna lose your butt. So when I've looked at all the investors of very large reputations, um, Warren Buffett, Carl Icahn, George Soros, they all only have one thing in common. And it's the exact opposite of what they teach in a business school. It's they make large, concentrated bets where they have a lot of conviction. They're not buying 35 or 40 names and diversifying. I don't know whether you remember, uh, Icon a few years ago put $5 billion into Apple. And 
I don't think he was worth more than $10 billion when he did that. When I went in to tell Soros that I was going to short 100% of the fund in the British pound against the Deutschmark, he looked at me with great disdain because he thought the story was good enough that I should be doing 200%. So A, they concentrate their holdings. B, concentration, this is very counterintuitive. It really gets your intention. In my, in my thinking, decreases your overall risk. Because where you tend to be in trouble is if you have 35 or 40 names and you stop paying attention to one. If you have big, massive positions, um, it has your attention. If you're going to bet big, you have to be ruthlessly objective about your position. I put on positions I was 100% sure I'd have for two or three years, and 10 days later, in my opinion, the facts changed, and I'm out of them. But if you're going to go the route of making concentrated bets, you also have to go the route of being completely open-minded um, when the facts change of being wrong. You can't sit down in there and double down if things don't start to work out. The people that love it like me are so addicted to it and so intellectually stimulated by it. If you're not and you're in for the money, you have no chance competing with these people. They're going to outwork you. They're going to out-execute you. So, and I think it's probably true of a lot of professors, but let's not forget, if you're American, you're probably going to spend 60 to 70 hours a week minimum working. If you're in your job for the money, and not because you love it, you just blew 70 hours a week on the have, on the happiness quotient. That's pretty rough. Right. So I would tell a 20 year old, follow your passion. I was just lucky. I followed my passion. My mother in law says I'm an idiot savant and I wouldn't be good at anything else. But I would do this for 50,000 a year. I really would. I just I just love it. And I hate to see young people get trapped in something and I would also say, keep an open mind. I started uh, at Bowdoin as an English major. I took economics just so I could read the paper intelligently. I went to get a PhD in economics. And I went there and I said, these people are crazy. They're trying to shove the economy into a math formula. It doesn't make any sense. Then I went to, I worked construction for six months. I got kind of a weak upper body, so that didn't work for me. Then I went to uh, the bank and I found out what I was just in love with. And so try stuff out. And if you're not really, really engaged during the day and you're not happy, uh, move on to something else because there's, there's something out there for everybody. But I would not let money be the driver of the equation. That can lead to a lot of not maximizing what I call the happiness quotient.